this is my absolute uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Varun Desh Pandey. He is a managing director of uh, the Good Food Institute India. And as a son of a cancer surgeon from Mumbai, Varun has been deeply immersed in healthcare and technology from a very young age. He spent several formative years studying chemical and biomedical engineering at the technology hub Carnegie Mellon University. He then went on, went on to work on implementing digital health in India and the United States, helping vulnerable populations uh, through care coordination and a system approach to healthcare. While in the US, Varun learned about effective altruism of philosophy, which seeks to investigate and target the world's most pressing problems. He came to understand the tremendous impact of the industrial animal agriculture on the world and the imperative need to transition away from it using markets and technology. In dedicating his work to the uh, future of protein and combining his duty to human and planetary health, Varun aims to help build a more healthy, sustainable, and just global food system starting right, in, right here in India. And uh, uh, we welcome you, Varun, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, uh, the person who will be in conversation with uh, Varun is uh, Professor Ravi Miglani. He's a professor of practice uh, from Amrit Modi School of Management. He has a vast uh, years of experience in the field of marketing research and consumer insights and has worked across the domain, including market research, consumer behavior, customer engagement, and research-based marketing consulting. He did his uh, uh, PGP from uh, IIM Ahmedabad, and he began his uh, research career uh, with TNS, uh, Kantar TNS as a research manager. He went on to become the managing director of Kantar TNS North Africa. And then uh, uh, he was managing Middle East, North Africa, and Southeast Asia before returning to India and joining us at Ahmedabad University as a professor of practice. More than that, Professor Ravi Miglani is a passionate about uh, reading on food and debating on food and cooking and understanding various uh, uh, ways of sustainable food and agriculture. So uh, I request both of you to begin the conversation today. Just a minute I'll take. Uh, I, this is just an information to all the participants that the conversation will go for the next 50, 55 minutes. In between, if you have any question, you can put your question uh, in the chat box to everyone. And we'll take all your questions. And at the end of the conversation, both these speakers will address the questions. So thank you so much for joining us. And floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sudhir. And welcome again, Varun. Uh, I'm really, really happy uh, doing this webinar today. I've, I've been in conversations in a few other webinars in the past few months. But this one is the closest to my heart because it's about food. The only difference is that I'm interested in cooking and eating food today, while Varun looks at food 30 years down the line. I don't have that kind of patience. So, <laughs> so it's, it's great that we have Varun who will tell us the future of food, while I, I know only the present of food, uh, the cooking and the eating of food. Uh, but I, I do take a keen interest in food, and I would want to be well fed 30 years down the line. So Varun's guidance will certainly help all of us. Um, one other quick note on the polls. Uh, uh, Varun, it must be clear to you that our audience is very well aware and, and proficient in this topic, which makes your task easier or more difficult. They might be more, more tough on you, uh, but they, know, they, they certainly know a lot about uh, this. So let, let's get started. Varun, in addition to all the credentials that uh, Sudhir listed for Varun, uh, we know that Varun is involved in all aspects of new food, especially alternative protein. And he'll tell us more about what al alternative protein or smart protein means. He looks at the business, the science, the technology, the financing, the politics, all aspects of uh, the new protein that we need to all move towards to make the world more sustainable. Uh, so uh, Varun, as I had warned you earlier, I will uh, to some extent being uh, be, act like a devil's advocate in this conversation um, so that I provoke you into uh, giving us uh, insights into where the in world of food is going. Uh, let me just start with giving a very basic premise of what uh, where the problem starts and Varun will then talk about the solutions. So we know and uh, in popular media and everywhere we keep hearing about uh, how much pressured our current food system and especially our meat production system is putting on the uh, earth in terms of pressure on land, 
because it keeps using more and more land and clearing forests. And the more forests we clear, the, uh, the more degradation of the climate. And it keeps taking us closer and closer to uh, wildlife and in terms of proximity to wildlife which leads to various zoonotic viruses that we are now currently uh, suffering from. Uh, uh, there's excessive water usage. There is greenhouse gas emissions from uh, food production, especially from animals. Uh, so we, we have been reading in popular press without being experts that the current food system is getting close to a breaking point. Um, we, uh, we've got into the cycle of uh, growing plants and then feeding the plants to animals and then eating the animals. And uh, the number of calories that go into feeding these animals uh, is far more, several times more than the calories we get out of the meat that, um, that is, comes out of the animals. We also, I'm sure, read a lot of numbers like two thirds of the earth arable land is, didn't, is used up by livestock, but it contributes to only about one third of our protein intake and so on. So I can go on throwing statistics, but I'm sure Varun knows these statistics uh, much better than I do. So Varun, uh, with this background, and we as laymen keep hearing up these uh, numbers being thrown at us in popular media, where is the problem? Uh, before we get to the solution, what's the problem? Mm. Firstly, thank you so much. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Tough crowd, easy crowd, devil's advocate or not. I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, and thank everyone in the, uh, in the audience as well for joining us on a Saturday evening. And, and you, Raviji, and, and everyone on the, on, on the organizing team as well at Ahmedabad University. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, obviously, I share um, the same kinship with you, Raviji, about this topic being very close to my heart as well. And I think you framed the problem really, really well, right? Uh, we have come to a point uh, in history where uh, we have two sides of an equation. We have protein demand. And when I say protein demand, I mean specifically demand for meat, eggs, dairy, seafood uh, is growing all over the world, but especially in the developing world, right? In places like India, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, China, as incomes continue to rise, uh, people are demanding more and more meat, eggs, and dairy. It's a natural impulse because these foods are very tasty. They are prestige foods, right? They're aspirational foods. Uh, they, they have this halo effect of containing a lot of protein, which they do. Um, and they, they have a lot of, um, they satisfy people, right? They bring people together and they're culturally deep rooted as well. On the other side of this equation, um, the way that we currently get these foods, meat, eggs, dairy, seafood, is we have to rely on animals. That's the definition of these, food, right? of these foods. But as you said, Raviji, uh, animals are a really, really bad protein production platform. They're very inefficient. And just to add a little bit more to the numbers that you were saying, I mean, we, uh, as you said, uh, actually over 75% of all agricultural land is currently used to feed li livestock or to grow crops to feed livestock. Uh, and then we get meager returns from all of it. And the reason for all of this is very simple, as you outlined as well. We are eating animals who have to eat those, those feeds, right, those, those plants. So a chicken, which is one of the most efficient land farmed animals, takes in nine calories of input to give you one calorie of output in the form of flesh. And again, the reason for this is quite intuitive. You and I are sitting here having this conversation. We are burning calories, right? So same, same thing. A chicken is a living, breathing organism. You know, it, whatever it's doing, it, it's metabolizing, it's growing feathers, it's growing beak. It's, it, it's got all these, these things we don't need. And that's why it takes the nine calories of input to give us one calorie of output in the form of meat. And you know, pigs are much worse than that. Cows are much, much worse. Fish, depending on the fish, are usually much worse than that. So we are using all of these resources, land, water, energy, and emitting all of these greenhouse gases and other effluents in order to get quite meager returns. So that's kind of the root of the problem here, but that's not even the end of it, right? So what we're talking about now is sustainability, and we've kind of laid out the problem. And people have been talking about sustainability and animal um, protein supply for decades. If you talk to anyone from the UN, from uh, the Eat Lancet Commission, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, all of these expert organizations that are focused on sustainability, they will tell you that if we care about ocean dead zones, ocean acidification, greenhouse gas emissions, deforestation, climate change, global warming, anything under the, the ambit of sustainability, 
then this whole scale up of industrial animal agriculture is one of the top two or three problems affecting any of those things. And so we should care about it, right? But it's not just that. In order to grow these animals, to produce them uh, in huge numbers, we have to produce them in close quarters to each other. And that can create all sorts of challenges on the public health side as well. So obviously we are having this conversation right now uh, in, I don't know if we're still in the middle of it or if we're coming to the end of it, but we have faced an unprecedented situation globally, a pandemic. We've seen what's happened over the last year, how it's brought the public health systems, economic systems grinding to a halt. It's brought the world into crisis. Because of the way we grow animals and what is called zoonotic diseases that emerge from them, uh, that actually increases the risk of pandemics like COVID-19 happening again in the future, right? So again, UN environmental program uh, or any of these other groups, they'll tell you that zoonotic diseases are the primary cause of global pandemics. There's a reason why, if you just think about it, um, swine flu, avian flu, all of these things emerge uh, from animals, right? There's a reason why the, these, these names are now inside our public consciousness, but perhaps we haven't thought about it as much. In fact, all across the country right now, avian flu is affecting the supply of poultry, et cetera, right? So uh, all we need is for more of these diseases to jump from animals to humans, and then we can get future epidemics or pandemics. Equally, we have to feed the animals antibiotics also to keep them well, which creates another twin threat to public health. So you have these zoonotic diseases, and then you have potential antimicrobial resistance. So don't take it from me, take it from the former health of the World Health Organization, Margaret Chan. She said a few years ago that uh, it could lead us, this system could lead us into a world where common infections will once again kill. And it'll be the end of modern medicine as we know it, right? So this is like, it could throw us back into a pre-antibiotic era. And it's gonna take, you know, billions of dollars of research to transcend this problem. Whereas it's happening because we're feeding the vast majority, 70 plus percent, 75 plus percent of antibiotics to farmed animals instead of to humans, right? And, you know, I'll just underline all of this by saying, uh, the goal is not to, to vilify animal protein production. What we're saying is the producers of animals are often the victims of these problems in the first place, right? So if you look at China, for example, over the last two or three years, 60% of that country's pig population, right? The captive, captive pig population that is bred for meat um, has died or needed to be killed because of what is known as African swine fever. And that country is so dependent on pig production economically that they jokingly call their consumer price index, the CPI, they jokingly call it the China pig index. Can you imagine the untold economic destruction for all of the smallholder as well as large holdings of, uh, of pig farms in China? So this is all of the, the, the issues that we currently face. Uh, and I'm seeing a question in the audience that's a very, you know, that I think we should get to the solution. Um, I'll just close out this answer by saying that uh, all of these problems are more urgent and bigger in the developing world. Problems of food safety, problems of public health, problems of food security, where we're using all this land and feeding all these calories to animals, whereas we should be more efficient. They are most pronounced in the developing world. We have the most, we have the biggest challenges to feed our growing population, the biggest challenges of water scarcity, all of these problems, right? So I hope, I hope that kind of gives a general sense of the problem that we are facing overall. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, maybe we stay for another couple of minutes on the problem before we get to the solution. We should, of course, spend the bulk of the time on looking at potential solutions. Uh, one other problem, which I'm no scientist, but I understand that uh, animals don't create protein or synthesize protein. Only plants and microbes create protein. So how did the world, how did human beings get into this cycle of growing plants, getting protein, feeding the protein to the animal, and then slaughtering the animal to get the protein back and only a small fraction of the protein back. How did this loop start and what, why, why were animals part of this loop? Mm -hmm. Frankly, the loop didn't start because humans wanted to eat more protein. The loop started because um, humans wanted to eat delicious foods and celebratory foods. And they wanted to, you know, we domesticated animals some, uh, you know, hundreds or, or tens of thousands of years ago, right? In, in sequence, we domesticated different animals. And in fact, uh, imagine if we had domesticated pigs instead of dogs, right? Or, you know, imagine if we had 
um, as some cultures do, eaten dogs instead of pigs. It, it would be complete. It, it's just kind of random in that respect. We would have just figured out the best strains of dog and just eaten the strains of dog, right? So there is a randomness to it, Raviji, but also humans, what we found, and you know this from your prior work in, in market research, et cetera, most humans eat food. They eat delicious food that, that keeps them happy and keeps them satiated. They do not necessarily eat protein, carbs, and fats. They do not necessarily eat micronutrients. Those things give a halo effect to the food. So you know, if something happens to contain higher protein, then the vast majority of the population says that's fine. Um, there's a top end of the market that says, I need my protein, I'm counting my calories, I'm counting my ma macronutrients. But most people, they're eating food, they're not eating protein, carbs, and fats, right? So uh, it's because meat, eggs, and dairy are delicious, right? And, and, and I would argue that we shouldn't try and take away these things from people. That, that's where we get to the kind of solutions. Great. Okay. Um, I think let's get one question out of the way, which I'm sure a lot of lot of our people in the audience uh, are, are thinking about. India is a vegetarian country. Uh, everyone around the world keeps saying India is a vegetarian country. So why is it all this relevant for India if we are a vegetarian country? Are we a vegetarian country? Yeah, let me, so let me make the case that India is a vegetarian country. We actually eat very little meat currently. Right? We're among the lowest in the world when it comes to eating meat. Per capita, that is per person per year, we eat about six kilograms, depending on which figure you look at, six kilograms of meat and seafood every year. And that, not counting eggs and dairy, obviously we eat a lot of dairy. Um, and the US eats over a hundred kilograms per capita, right? And actually that's just kind of analogous to other areas like energy use, right? Like, so the US uses a ton of energy. China uses a ton of energy relative to India. The problem arises because we oftentimes don't realize what the trajectory is and how quickly the trajectory changes, right? So if you look at any of the, the data, as well as marry this with kind of anecdotal, have one-to-one -one direct conversations, um, the consensus and the, the reality is that we will not be as vegetarian as this for very long. Firstly, 70% of our population says that they are non-vegetarian. This is in large scale government census level surveys, the sample registration survey of 2014 and then subsequent surveys as well. Uh, and the reason for this is because while we believe we are very vegetarian from a religious standpoint, uh, whether it comes to egg consumption or even meat consumption, uh, the stricture is often not religion because these foods are very tempting, they're temptation goods, right? Um, the stricture is often income and supply of these things. So if you and I went to so I live in Mumbai, about 1.5 kilometers away from Dharavi, the largest slum in Asia, right? Uh, if we went there and we talked to a family of four, they would say we're eating one mutton meal a week for 460 rupees. And if we could, we would eat two mutton meals a week for 920 rupees. Because as I said at the beginning of the conversation, it's a prestige good. It brings people together, right? And people love to eat it. So as incomes continue to rise, this is a story that's played out pretty much in every country around the world, meat consumption will continue to rise. And that's gonna have all the terrible impacts on the planet, both locally and globally, in terms of water scarcity, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of what we're looking to address here is we're looking to uh, address a problem that we're seeing five years, 10 years into the future. And all of the businesses that actually construct large scale poultry facilities or large scale aquaculture facilities will tell you the same thing. They're seeing COVID notwithstanding, COVID is nothing to them because they're seeing 25% year on year demand growth locally for things like chicken. So that, that's a huge trajectory in terms of where we're gonna go. And if you look at the maps from the FAO and all of these other organizations that map this stuff, um, they, they're gonna tell you that the hottest zone for demand growth of all of this is South Asia, a little bit of Latin America, a little bit of China. Okay, uh, so um, we are now um, uh, at doomsday <laughs> or, or approaching doomsday. It's like, a, as, as they say, a train wreck in slow motion. It's coming, but because we don't see a change day to day, we probably take it a bit uh, lightly, just like all of climate change. Because we don't see things changing from today to tomorrow, we are not taking it seriously, but it is a train wreck. It will happen. It's just happening in slow motion. So, so problem established. So what do we do? What is, can we start looking at solutions from your 
kind of GFI point of view and, and a broader point of view? How do we get out of this uh, food cycle that we have got into? Mm. So over the last decades, people have identified this problem, right? They've been talking about it. There've been a bunch of books about it. More recently, media, media like documentaries, et cetera, have made an impact. And most of those approaches have, or most of those media, um, you know, most of those initiatives have focused on asking people to give up, asking people to sacrifice. They've said, please eat chickpeas, not chicken, right? Because they've said, oh, chicken releases 40 to 60 times more carbon dioxide per calorie of protein than lentils, okay? So please eat lentils, not chicken, eat chickpeas, not chicken, uh, or eat, be eat broccoli, not beef in other parts of the world. But that hasn't worked. <laughs> so, you know, at the end of 2019, 2020 was a down year for everything. But at the end of 2019, um, even the Western countries where you're hearing a lot about, oh, veganism is taking off and this, that, and the other, uh, meat had its biggest year in history in all Western countries. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, it's, uh, the data indicates that those approaches simply have not worked, right? And it makes sense. Even for you, Raviji, from your previous life will say, look, you can't ask people to sacrifice. You have to give them a switch. You have to give them an alternative. So that's kind of the focus that we take at GFI and the sector that we represent and that we build and that we kind of form the backbone of. Uh, it's called alternative proteins or smart protein. The goal here is to make what people want, but made in a different way that does not have the same burdens on the planet, on biodiversity, scarce natural resources, et cetera, right? So we're talking about uh, different categories of foods that give people exactly the same taste of meat, eggs, and dairy, uh, but made in a different way. To give you an example, uh, plant-based meats are products that are made from plant or crop ingredients like soy protein isolate, pea protein isolate, mixed with coconut oil, mixed with beetroot juice. And the focus is on going much beyond the previous generation of nuggets or soy chaff. Those are consigned to history now. What we're saying is plant-based meats are focused on perfectly replicating the sensory and the cultural experience of conventional animal meat. This kind of started in the US because the US, as I said, is the biggest polluter, the biggest issue. Right, the, the biggest consumer of meat, the biggest consumer of beef. So these innovators said, look, like the Americans are eating three beef burgers a week on average, which is for all sorts of reasons, as we discussed, really, really bad for, for their own health, for the environment, etc. Whereas plants contain all the components that are in meat, right? So they contain protein, amino acids, they contain lipids, that is fats, they contain minerals, they contain water, right? And so can we look at all the research that's ongoing on creating um, replacements for meat? And can we bring something to market? So companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods poured dozens of millions of dollars into research to perfectly replicate the sensory and cultural experience of meat. So as I say, you know, if you're, if you're an American and you are at a, a, a revered national pastime, like a baseball game or a backyard barbecue, you should be able to throw an impossible burger, which is made entirely from plants or a beyond burger, again, made entirely from plants on a grill, get the same smell of meat, right? They even did research like at what frequency, sound frequency do, does a beef burger sizzle and they replicated that, right? To give you that perfect sensory experience. And these companies are now, they, they basically created an industry. They're doing incredibly well. Both companies are multi-billion dollar companies. And I know you said earlier that this is 30 years in the future, but because of companies like this and because of scientific research and, and policy support, this is actually the leading edge of food innovation today. So plant-based meats, just to repeat, are a category that's, that's blown up globally and in fact will take root in India as well. I take it we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the, what's happening in India a little further into the conversation. Another category that's an example, and I see people are writing about seaweed and algae and all of that in the chat. Uh, another category is called fermentation-derived proteins where you're looking at microorganisms like fungi or microalgae, and you're doing similar things. You're saying, look, I wanna, I wanna give consumers what they want so that it feels like a simple switch and not a sacrifice. And I want producers to be involved in this as well. So, you know, same, same thing, bringing to bear the techniques of food science and, and upscaling. So chemical engineering, all of these things, uh, manufacturing and bringing to market products in the meat, egg, dairy categories, right? That taste like conventional animal meat, eggs, dairy. Uh, but happen to be made from other things. And then finally, there's a, a third category that's really very futuristic and exciting called cultivated meat, which means 
cultivating the cells of animals directly. So you take a little biopsy or a little scraping of an animal and you produce chicken meat. So you're cutting out the middle animal. You don't even have to slaughter the animal. Um, and this is something also that's grown a lot. It's a little farther away from market and being able to compete with the cost of conventional meat. Uh, but now it's, you know, Singapore approved it for sale in December for the first time in history. So this is very much a reality as well. So these are the solutions that we're advocating and we work across business, science and policy to make these a reality and take them forward in the marketplace. Yeah. Okay, great. So just to get all the terminology right. So mm, you've used many words, alternative proteins, smart protein, cell-based protein, um, uh, clean meat, cultivated meat. But broadly, there are two groups, uh, just for my clarity. There is plant-based, which has no animal uh, cells in it, plant-based, which could be uh, fermentation or other, other methods like mm, soy-based or pigeon pea-based, etc. And then there is meat-based, but grown from cell upwards, not by um, um, growing full animals, but taking scrapings and cells and, and creating a whole meat product out of it. So those are the two groups, right? Okay. Sorry, you've gone unmute. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. the, on, the only reason why I would say it's three is because technically fungi and algae are not a plant. Yeah. They are a microorganism that's separate from the plant kingdom. So we break them out into a third category and we say, look, this is fermentation derived because they grow by fermentation and plants grow by photosynthesis. It's just a, it's just kind of a technicality, but um, you know, all three very exciting categories, plant-based, absolutely driving food innovation forward globally. Uh, Beyond Meat is public on the New York Stock Exchange. You can take a look at them. They just announced a partnership with PepsiCo last yeah. week, right? Yeah. So uh, they're, you know, traditional meat producers, traditional food companies are seeing them as the innovators and trying to get on the train with them. So uh, that's really taken off and cultivated meat is also going to take off over time. Um, one other thing to clarify, which I keep getting asked, and again, I have no clue, so, uh, <clears throat> is people say, why do Good Food Institute and others, other such innovators so focused on protein, um, especially in countries like India, a small part of our calories come from protein, a much larger part comes from carbohydrates and fats and so on, unlike the US and Western markets where I'm just throwing a rough number, but about a third of their calories comes from proteins. In India, about 15 odd percent comes from protein. So why focus on protein? Why not other nutrients? Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, I would argue that it's a problem that uh, such a large proportion of our calories come from other things, right? So we are the diabetic, diabetes capital of the world. Um, if you look at the, the traditional Indian thali, we don't actually consume that way anymore, right? Like we, we're very, very cereal dominant in the way that we eat currently across the length and breadth of the country on average. There's, there's vast differences across the country, but I'm just taking a, a kind of reductionist average here. Like for example, in the South and in the West, uh, like West Bengal, there's a lot more meat and fish consumption than there is in North India, but just taking a, 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 an average, we have far too much cereal consumption. So it is a problem that our macronutrient mix is off um, but the main thing that, that, that we want to highlight here is that even though, you know, it's possible to make cereals better or to make carbohydrates better and more sustainable and things like that, the major problem, the ticking time bomb is meat consumption. Uh, it is orders of magnitude more unsustainable than those other things that we're talking about. And that's why that's the specific problem we focus on. Um, and, you know, there are other organizations doing other things, but um, this is the neglected huge problem of our time alongside energy transformation and then beyond that electrifying the transportation grid, remaking meat is the principal problem of our time if we want to save the planet. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, there, there is this trend that is of uh, going high tech, going innovative, uh, getting to clean, clean meat, cell-based meat, plant-based meat. But uh, again, there are naysayers and I am kind of representing them today here is why not go back to the good old days. All of these things are caused by industrial scale, animal farming and clearing of uh, forests for ranches and, and, and uh, putting millions of chickens in small coops and so on. Why not go back to whatever you call it? Organic is a bit of a cliched word, but why not go back to the way you, we used to grow food 50, 100 years ago? 
and and we we are back to square one no problem is there a problem with that yeah because it doesn't work we've been trying to we've been trying to do that for decades we've been trying to tell people to to eat differently for decades and uh, while there are technologies emerging across the spectrum um and you know some of those technologies will certainly help reduce food waste etc in other ways um right now the genie's out of the bottle right people are craving meat eggs and dairy and who am i to tell them not to eat it so our goal is to make sure that we have the least impact on this planet absolutely shrink by orders of magnitude our impact on the planet down and still give people what they want right so you are exactly right we are at a really bad place because of the industrialization of animal agriculture specifically we are at this point in history where now we have to completely remake our supply chains and remake our protein supply uh, but we cannot again we cannot simply tell people to eat chickpeas not chicken because that doesn't work and this is true at every level of the socio economic pyramid even at the top end of the pyramid where people are saying oh veganism is growing and all of this stuff is happening because their brother in law watched game changers and decided that the game changers documentary and, and heard a lot about this stuff and decided that they were going to be vegetarian i mean anecdotally uh, every single one of us probably knows people that have made this pledge and i can almost guarantee you they did not stick to it it is not a sustainable pledge to make my brother in law my sister my family are examples of this i do this for a living i'm mostly vegan i eat a little bit of dairy here and there um my family tried and it's just incredibly hard to stay away from meat eggs and dairy and from a social justice angle as well like i said um you know lower socio economic groups it is not just for us to ask them to stay off meat eggs and dairy if they want to eat meat eggs and dairy if people at any level of the socio economic pyramid want to do that we we can't you know stop them from doing it we just have to give them means of doing it in a much better way and i mean this even for producers we need to give producers technologies and ways to do it much better and consumers ways to consume much better that's our goal here yeah um, just as a corollary to what i said earlier i did not imply that we tell people to eat chickpea not chicken eat chicken but eat chicken the way we used to eat chicken 50 years ago what what is today in organic terminology has fancy names like uh, farm farm grown chicken and uh, uh, free free range chicken and free range eggs as in not cooped up not uh, industrialized not uh, antibiotic uh, fed etc the way chicken and egg and goats and cows used to roam the farm and and provide uh, good wholesome food is that not workable because of the sheer quantity of that that we need it's not going to be workable so currently and of course this could go down as as scales go up currently an organic egg costs something like 24 rupees an egg and a regular egg costs 4 to 6 rupees an egg i mean who's going to buy that even i wouldn't buy it um if i were if i you know i care deeply about this problem if i if i ate eggs i wouldn't buy an organic egg very often i might do it once or twice and feel good about myself but it's not going to happen in a sustained manner so you know i think we can bring that price down but incremental approaches are not going to really help us here um and this is borne out by the data as well there's been you know very recent research reports that say that regenerative agriculture etc all all great solutions generally um to gen to some specific problems like soil health etc but in terms of planetary health overall they're not going to solve the problem um and in fact you know currently people you know i i could fool myself very easily into thinking i am by doing that so any of the research any of the surveys um that again you would be an expert in any of the surveys will show that americans and indians want to eat organic they'll say that 20 30% of them say we want to eat organic whereas like 0.5% of the population actually buys organic yeah just, that is just an issue off. which as a market researcher by by profession i know that if you ask people they'll give you uh, the politically correct answers they'll tell you yes i want to um, um eat uh, healthy i want to save the planet and so on but uh, doesn't happen because uh, uh, if people uh, uh, incomes are growing and therefore people want to eat well the way um, people in aspirational cultures eat and and so on so asking people questions doesn't help and we need far more subtle ways of going under the skin of the consumers to see what what are they motivated by and and i completely second your earlier comment a few minutes ago saying that we can't tell people to eat better for the goodness of their heart or for doing well for the planet or to save the planet that doesn't work we see it from all other 
mean, we've been telling people not to 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 use less fuel, to use less plastic, to use uh, sustainable materials um, hasn't made a huge impact. There are some uh, um, um, symbolic changes. Um, Starbucks starting to give you paper straws rather than plastic straws, but those 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 are tokenism. Those are not going to change the world. So people will be convinced only if they get a good answer to the question, what is in it for me? Not what is in it for the planet? Because deep down, we don't care about the planet. We care about our, our enjoyment and our family's enjoyment at dinner time, not what it will do to the planet 20 years down the line. So yep, completely agreed with that. Yep, sorry, you, you want to? And just to respond to that, look, I'm here to say that that's totally fine. That, that makes complete sense, as you say. Like, that's not, you know, we, we're not here to moralize about it. We, we want to take morality off the plate, right? Like, we want to not tell people uh, to eat less. And, you know, things like bans, etc. Governments have banned single-use plastics in some, in some places. I think, um, overall, uh, if you go and talk to vendors who've had to switch out single-use plastics for other things, or if you go into the medical industry and talk about switching out single-use plastics for other things, it really disadvantages the entire supply chain. What we need is transformative innovation that brings us out of these situations, and that's what we're going for. And just to address the thing that what people actually want over and over again, in every country in the world, when we test what people actually make buying decisions based on, no matter what they tell you, they might tell you, I care about health, I care about the environment, I care about animals, I care about organic, I care about all of these things, it boils down to basically two or three factors, taste, price, and convenience. That's it, right? In India, I might add, depending on the socioeconomic level in other parts of the world as well, I might add aspiration, like status, right? Consumption as a, as a marker of status, um, but that's about it. And to the extent that it, it strikes me that we shouldn't even be conducting consumer research anymore, it's a waste of time. It's you know, we don't even need to overcomplicate things. Let's give people products that taste the same or better and cost the same or less to enable joy and to enable consumption, um, but made in a different way so it's not breaking the planet any longer. Okay. Um, so I've, I've been looking at, and you know them much more intimately than I do, but these organizations like Impossible and Beyond, Beyond Meat and so on, they are mostly focused on synthesizing um, products that mimic meat in the form that most Western cultures would eat meat, like a steak or a burger patty and so on. In India, most of our food consumption is unprocessed, so to say. Um, I, I don't know whether there's a technical word for it, but it's unprocessed, as in we, we don't process it into sausages or, 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 or burgers and so on. We eat meat as is, we, we eat vegetables as it with spices and curry and so on. So will this these new forms of protein be able to match the form factor of the way we eat in India? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, uh, India, as I said earlier, like, and like, like you rightly outlined just now, is very heterogeneous and, and fascinatingly diverse. That's what we love about you know, the country as well, right? from north to south, east to west, language and, and food and all of these things change every 200 kilometers, which is great. It does create some challenges for what you said um, in terms of the, the diversity of, of meats and, and even egg dishes and, and dairy dishes that are eaten. There's so much that we do. There's kebabs, curries, each of these things like kind of go change across the, the entire nation. Um, there's kemas, there's biryani. Biryani is emerging as a huge hero on platforms like Swiggy and Zomato. Biryani has grown a lot uh, because I think it's something like you can order in-house that, that gives you that indulgence of meat and that celebration. But uh, just one thing to note that these plant-based meats are highly versatile. So Impossible Foods went from Michelin star restaurant in the US with an Impossible Burger to very quickly within six to eight months, fast food in terms of cost competitiveness. Then they launched in places like Singapore and they were in 140 restaurants in Singapore within four months of launching. And they're being served as the impossible beef Wellington, obviously entirely plant-based at Gordon Ramsay's upscale restaurant in Singapore, as well as at a hawker center, which is a street, uh, street vendor in rendang pie, which is a local dish. Even now Starbucks has taken an impossible rendang pie to market over there, right? So they've really focused very quickly on 
getting into dumplings, really embedding into the local cultural context, all of this stuff that makes sense for East Asia. And we can do the same in India. So we'll see a lot of companies that have already launched or will launch um, that are going to launch things like kebabs, kheemas, curries, et cetera. And we like to say, we need to go beyond the burger in India. One thing I will note though is you're right. Up until this point, 90% of meat that is bought is bought organized at your local chop shop. Right? Not, not nest, I mean, you can pay them a little extra to do it, I think, to clean it and to, and to give you the proper, like to, to give you a chicken breast, et cetera. But it's very unorganized, informal. It's still processed, right? To grow the chicken and all of that stuff is still processing and then to, to chop it up and give it to you, that's still processing technically. Um, but uh, it's not the same as, as in the West. But if you look at companies like Licious, Meaty Go, Fresh to Home, um, that behavior is, is increasing. I mean, it, it's showing they've grown a lot, especially during the pandemic when people care more about food safety right now. They've grown you know, 3x, 10x in the last several months. Um, and it's showing that if you give people the option, granted it's much more expensive right now, but if you give people the option of convenience, they will take it. Right? So I think even that behavior will change over time. Uh, going back to the topic, all, all of it is just to say these plant-based meats are very versatile and we're going to see them come out in a variety of different products. I would just caution for the audience that these are not your previous generation of soya chops or soya nuggets that are already out there in the market. So if you've had a, an experience of eating those things and said, look, like this doesn't work for me because it doesn't actually taste like meat, I would say have some patience because the companies that are launching now and will launch over the next few months will certainly get a lot closer um, to that 2.0 version of this, which is the next generation plant-based meat, not the previous generation mock meat or soya chow. So these uh, plant-based meats, um, the reason why in the West they are made to look and taste and even sound like a, a burger patty or a steak or, a, and in India, companies are trying to make it look like the kind of meat that goes into a biryani or a chicken tikka uh, uh, and, and so on means that this the target market for this is people who currently eat meat but since there's a large part of the country who does not eat meat and these plant-based product proteins are certainly very good source of protein for everyone why are we only focused on mimicking meat why not make these into new forms it doesn't have to look like meat because obviously the moment it looks like meat you're cutting out the people who don't eat meat yeah, that's very well said. And I think other categories like tempeh or tofu, even jackfruit, all of those things that don't quite approach this level of mimicking meat are growing and will continue to grow in India, right? And, you know, all of those things are great because they'll satisfy, especially vegetarians, even non-vegetarians will try them and eat them on occasion, maybe not to replace meat because they don't quite get there. Uh, but, you know, those kinds of, um, I guess, whole foods, plant-based products that are on that side of things uh, will continue to grow and we're happy about that. that that's all good stuff. In fact, the, they don't even need as much help because there's, there's less development, they've existed for some time, et cetera. Uh, but what we do, the, the, the problem that we are really trying to solve is uh, the problem of giving meat eaters a switch that makes sense so that they don't just go back to eating meat after trying to eat fully plant-based for some time and saying, okay, jackfruit isn't cutting it for me, I'll just go back to eating mutton, right? So that, that's kind of uh, what we're trying to address here. In terms of the, uh, I just want to address what you said, because you're right, it's music to my ears to hear you say that, because this people have this misconception of, oh, will vegetarians eat plant-based meat? And the answer to that is, it's the wrong question to ask, right? It, they don't, they won't, because it's not meant for them. This is meant for meat eaters. And all of the research we've done in India, all of the early trials of all of these products, all of the missteps that some of the entrepreneurs have made, have shown that if you market this to vegetarians or vegans, it's not your target market. Right? Because you're trying to go for something that tastes like meat, you should market it to, um, to meat eaters, obviously. Uh, the early adopter cohort for this looks very much like their international counterparts. So people in places like uh, Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, Chennai, hopefully a bunch of tier two, tier three cities as well, Pune, etc., cetera, um, which is where I am right now, Pune, by the way. Um, they would also be looking at this in the same way that people in Singapore, Hong Kong, New York, Sydney, London, et cetera, are. So they're already consuming like their global counterparts. They're already ordering in a lot. They might be double income households, no kids households, high disposable income, uh, eating for the planet, right? And then the hope is that we can transcend that 
initial early adopter cohort, which is about 30 to 50 million, 75 million in, this, in these urban centers, and then go for a truly mass market solution, which gets to the point of targeting what I said earlier, even down to the price and taste that satisfies someone in an urban slum. So we can deliver great, affordable, tasty nutrition that is delicious and aspirational to everyone. That's the hope. Mm. Okay, and looking at it from the other side, we have um, of the story, we have been looking at it um, from the consumer side and from the planet side, the third stakeholder, no pun intended, the third stakeholder in it is the people and companies and uh, involved in the legacy meat production industry. Are they not going to sabotage this whole um, uh, plan because this kicks into their livelihood very directly. W what is in it for the current legacy meat industry? How are they supposed to survive this? Mm. So interestingly enough, globally, and you know, I think it sounds intuitive once you kind of talk through this, um, the, the biggest supporters of this to a great extent, um, aside from the, the initial kind of category creating startups themselves, have in fact been the large conventional meat producers because they see this as an opportunity to stay abreast of things that are coming on the horizon, right? They want to be a part of the future. They want to be a part of the transformation and they don't want to be disrupted, right? So if, um, if you look at, for example, Tyson Foods, which is the second largest meat producer in the world, the largest in America, they have a JV in India with Godrej called Godrej Tyson. Um, the CEO of Tyson Foods said in 2018, uh, if we can produce meat without the animal, why wouldn't we? Because they see the writing on the wall, right? So uh, nine out of the top 10 US meat producers have already invested in or started their own line of plant-based meats. And this is only going to grow, right? And this is happening all over the world. It's happening in Canada, Europe, et cetera. So we expect that the big food ecosystem, especially legacy meat, will definitely get involved in India as well. I think it will take a little bit longer because we have to see those winners emerge. Uh, in India. And as I say, the, this current cohort of emerging companies, we might see a big winner emerge from them. So hopefully they'll get in on that. One, one thing that always happens when you tell people in countries like India and other developing countries to save the planet and save the environment, the, the obvious and in, in fairness, uh, a very justified retort is when the West was moving into meat in consumption, growing their meat consumption, getting into industrial meat, or when the West was industrializing and destroying the planet, uh, no one cared. And now that we are beginning to get the money to eat real meat, you're telling me to eat uh, fake meat. <laughs> so how do you address that? Is I mean, the feeling is that it's not fair. Americans got to eat meat for half a century without anyone stopping them. Why are we stopping us now when we just about can afford it? Mm. Yeah, the, the way to address this, I, and it's a very fair criticism, and, it, and it's true also in energy consumption and all of those other things, right? Like why this is, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense from that perspective. We're not even consuming that much relative to them. Um, the way that I would think about addressing this problem is to set a very, very high bar for plant-based meat, cultivated meat, fermentation-derived meats, et cetera, and, and eggs and dairy as well, by the way. We have to be able to supply products that genuinely taste the same or better and eventually cost the same or less, that supply the nutrition, the aspiration, the temptation, the indulgence of meat that happen to be better for the planet, right? And we are talking about, we're talking about making a better product. I'll give you an example. Right now, accessibility of meat in India is very low because of income, right? As incomes continue to rise, meat will, meat will continue to be consumed. But will people in India be able to afford a bluefin tuna or a luxury meat like that, I think that's gonna be really difficult in perpetuity. So what I'm saying is let's look at making even the best meats in the world available, just made in a different way. A bluefin tuna currently costs $5,000 per pound by weight because it's a species that's hunted in the Pacific. These are huge, huge fish. And because we hunt them, they are down to 3% of their population levels. So what I'm saying is let's make bluefin tuna available to everybody, just made from the cells of bluefin tuna or from plant-based plant, plant -based sources, but it has to taste perfect and it has to supply everything that consumers want. So let's make products that are better than what is currently available um, and provide all the same indulgence. And if I may use a 
kind of crass word to describe it, the sexiness that is associated with meat, right? Like that we, we should be able to supply all of that. And I think that's the way to provide the solution to the problem. So in a way we are basically mm, telling people um, not in so many words is what we sometimes call leapfrogging in many other mm, technologies or many other sectors. Like in people in India, a large population in India moved from no phone to a smartphone. We, we leapfrogged over um, the old style um, dial up phones and, and so on. And we landed from no phone to smartphone or we landed from uh, um, complete, from no banking to digital banking. Like most people in India were unbanked and they suddenly leapfrogged into Paytm and PhonePay and, and digital banking. And we've leapfrogged two or three generations of that product. So is, is this something in those line? We are leapfrogging from no meat to smart meat, kind yeah. of. That, 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 and we actually have, um, we don't, we're not in an office anymore because we're working fully remote, but we actually literally had a, a leapfrog jar in our office where I had to put in 10 rupees every time I said the word leapfrog in a public <laughs> forum. So I've now said it twice um, or three times. Um, but yeah, you're exactly right. Um, th th that's our theory of change here in India is, look, we're, we're rapidly industrializing. There's a rapid growth in, in, in the demand for these products, but to a certain extent, at least we can uh, work to leapfrog these industrial supply chains, both for you know, farmers, suppliers, large businesses, entrepreneurs, as well as for consumers and get to a better system right from the ground up. And if you look at, for example, M-Pesa in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, better, it is literally a better cash transfer protocol than what's available in the US because they built something crazy. It's highly uh, bureaucratic, et cetera. Whereas uh, M-Pesa is amazing. So we should be getting to a better system that makes sense in India uh, as soon as possible. And again, this is where it comes in. Like if we want to do that, we have to install the talent pool, the supply chain, the infrastructure, uh, the research funding, all of that now. We can't we can't wait till 2030 and say, oh, no, wait, we should have done something about this 10 years ago. So that, that's kind of why we exist. All right. Okay, so what I'll do is, uh, um, let's, uh, um, we have, as you are seeing, the chat box is kind of exploding. There is a lot of very good questions there. So uh, I think we, there is some more things that I want to talk to you, but let's talk about that in the context of the questions that are popping up because uh, we we are on a hard uh, stop at 420 425 or so 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 let's uh, sorry 525 25 so so let's uh, let's get to questions and especially we have from our university some some professors and some researchers and some students who are very passionate and doing a lot of good work in this area and i want to hear from them as well so um, so sudhir you you can um, uh, maybe, Sudhir, can we first hear from, uh, of course, uh, Professor Balaji Prakash. He is our uh, resident expert in this area. He knows much more about it than I do. And uh, let's hear from Balaji and his perspective and if he has questions or comments. And then uh, from a few students and other people in the audience. Hi, yeah, Balaji. Then, yeah, Hi, yeah, thank you, Ravi. Uh, I honestly don't have much to add here. Just to say that, I mean, I've been interested in this area and I've been associated with one of the food institutes for a while before I came to Ahmedabad University, the CFTRA in Mysore. In fact, uh, Varun, I met one of your colleagues there in one of these conferences, just when impossible foods had just come in and people were talking about it. But one concern that I think uh, people generally have is about, you know, two kinds, even when you say uh, plant-based meat, uh, is 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 the product the end product made completely from plant or are we talking about tissue culture the the animal tissue culture based uh, meat that is being made here because from for an Indian population I think this this might be an important chord to strike. I just so, uh, wanted. Yeah. Yeah, so just to clarify, plant-based meats are not made from tissue culture necessarily. They're just made from plant and crop ingredients, and they're, they're made using um, techniques that are quite commonly mm -hmm. used in the food industry, like extrusion, mm -hmm. et cetera, to get to mm -hmm. a product that, that has all the sensory attributes of meat. So there's, there's yeah. no real need for tissue culture involved there. Uh, what mm -hmm. I mentioned with cultivated meat, that's the other category, mm -hmm. that is used, made using cell culture and scaling up cell culture. So these are separate categories, and in fact, as uh, Raviji mentioned earlier, 
they are quite different in the sense that they both aim to do the same thing uh, but in terms of cultivated meat uh, mm -hmm. it could not be branded with a with a vegetarian logo for example because those are actual animal cells so if we yeah. if we if we made using cultivation of cells of uh, seafood uh, a mm -hmm. let's say cultivated um, let's stick with bluefin tuna and if i were allergic to bluefin tuna generally i could not eat mm -hmm. the cultivated version because it's biologically identical to bluefin yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah so i think these are two separate things and cultivated meat is currently very expensive Uh, mm -hmm. as as a process that is the big so it's very very expensive as a process yes. it it very rapidly as we scale up comes down in price but that's the major challenge there and in fact now as i mentioned earlier governments are seeing it as a viable as another viable solution so this all comes under this broad umbrella of alternative protein or smart protein just different categories different solutions to the same problem so uh, coming back to that you know that the as people perceive it if it is the plant based protein what about the amino acids that you are going to miss standard uh, biochemistry textbooks uh, teach you this there will there are some amino acids that you miss as for, when it comes from a plant how is that being taken care of yeah so possibly everyone's read the same uh, biochemistry textbook so so, so, the, so they're all yes. looking at they're all looking at addressing the problem right so yeah. um you know it's it's pretty easy in terms of you look at the limiting amino acids like methionine leucine lysine these are yeah. usually the, the limiting ones depending on which crop you're talking about and you create blends that make sense that create that complete protein so just a, in fact you know i mean there's not a lot of protein in it but if you take any kind of uh, cereal or grain and you take any kind of uh, legume and you combine them you technically get a complete protein which has all the amino acids right which is why peanut butter toast is a, is a good complete uh, nutritional profile so similarly what people have done with plant based meats is they've seen around this corner they're quite brilliant people from a biochemistry okay. standpoint said, sorry yeah so they've they've said that this is what we this is a problem that we want to address as well Uh, mm -hmm. and they've they've done they've taken care of not just that protein quality but also things like micronutrient density things like iron bioavailability all yeah. of that stuff are being looked at as well okay yeah thank you ravi um okay balaji thank you we yeah. we might uh, come back to you in in the next few minutes uh, sure. um one other um one part which for paucity of time we did not get into we we spent most of the time talking about meat and mm, and solutions to the meat situation we did not get much time to talk about dairy and our colleague professor puneet arora Uh, has a question in that area puneet are you able to come on camera and ask your question hi varun uh, so firstly i mean that's a great uh, discussion that we've uh, attended today uh, so i'm i'm a vegan and uh, i turned a vegan uh, about 8 months back from being a vegetarian like before that and uh, so because i wasn't consuming meat so so meat was never a problem for me but uh, as a vegetarian i mean milk is a big big milk or uh, other dairy products is a big big uh, chunk of your consumption basket right so uh, and today like when i go out uh, uh, like i cannot have any dessert i mean i have to go to special vegan restaurants to to get hands on dessert and uh, uh, like even i mean i am a punjabi so when you go for uh, those north, north indian restaurants i mean there are there are issues right mm -hmm. so i am i am very much okay with it so as you said you need to make compromises and i'm i'm happy making those compromises for the sake of planet i'm doing that my wife is doing that but when but we want others to also be doing it so i've been trying to convince others my family members but i haven't had any success and the major reason is that people are not willing to give up on the milk and its by products right so so there are alternatives there is soy milk there is cashew milk uh there are all the other kinds of milks but they're not uh, uh, as i mean as you as you've been mentioning about meat they do not taste the same therefore the use is not the same right so so is there any research being done on coming up with a milk which is completely identical to cow milk in taste and probably prices too yeah and firstly let me address what i am saying is we should not have to compromise right so what i'm yeah. saying what i'm saying is you and your family members should not have to compromise because those desserts that you're eating they're not very good either right and the reason the reason for that is because uh, same same deal with meat and eggs uh, we we want to be able to create foods that fulfill the same sensory and functional aspects of what they are replacing and milk is so versatile cow's milk is so versatile it has a specific set of parameters that we as humans have molded to over millennia right so we have we have created foods and things like that 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 leverage those specific 
parameters and qualities from a biochemistry standpoint of cow's milk. So when we're talking about plant-based milk or even the other categories are actually being used in dairy as well, fermentation derived and cultivation, et cetera, we need to be able to have the, I'll just rattle off a list of things, foaming, emulsification, stability, gelation, all of these things, all of these kind of science, food science parameters that exist currently in cow's dairy so that you and your family or especially your family who will set a higher bar for it uh, will be able to have all the foods and the desserts and the sweets and everything that they know and love and their chai and all of that stuff that they know and love. Uh, we have, I'll just do a quick plug. We have a ton of materials on, on all of this. Uh, the thing that will be really useful to you, Puneetji, is if you look at our plant-based dairy webinar, which lays out some of these things. So with some of the plant-based milks, like you said, even if I put it in tea or coffee, if it's hot, uh, it does what's known as feathering. It breaks up. And you don't want that. You want it to behave exactly like cow's milk currently does, or it won't feel like a simple switch. It'll feel like a sacrifice, right? So I, I would love to share any of these materials with, with anyone that's interested to learn more about this space from a technical or a business standpoint. Um, um, Thank you. Varun, um, one of the hats in addition to being a cook and a uh, eater and, uh, and trying to be a professor, I. I mentor a club, an extracurricular activity club in our university called the Food Club, predictably, <laughs> which is a fun club for cooking and eating good food, really. Uh, but it's not into the kind of uh, looking deep into the hist history and future of food as you do. Um, uh, Nikita is a student who is uh, passionate about this, and she runs that club along with her team. Nikita, you had some very interesting questions. You want to come on camera and ask those? Yes, sir. I'll be happy to do that. Uh, so, sir, my question is around uh, the commercialization of food. As we talk about the conversation right now, we are looking at the future of food. But when we actually leave this meeting, when we go out, we see companies like Licious Fresh, Zap Fresh, and so many other companies coming around and creating this new concept of, you know, a meat delivery to you. It's giving you convenience. It's giving you more than just meat. And people are turning towards it. So how do we uh, establish a red flag on the problem that we are talking about? How do we tell people that this is a problem and we are not supposed to go to this way, but that way? Yeah, great question, Nikita. Thank you for asking it. And uh, so the, the answer that I would give is you don't. Um, I think that some, some portion of your friends and some portion of your family will, will make changes based on morality or because they can afford to, etc. cetera. As, as Puneetji also said, though, um, will those changes be sustained if they find that, that what they're replacing it with is not satisfying them? I don't know, right? And the answer is usually no. So what we need to compete with is exactly that, is exactly what Licious and Zapfresh and Meetigo and and fresh to home and all of these companies are doing um, is to build out the supply chain, the infrastructure, and most importantly, bring products to market that taste the same or better and cost the same or less. That's the only way we're actually gonna, because telling people to go this way or that way um, is just not a reliable way of getting them to change anything. I think giving them alternatives. But the good news is, you know, like, like I was telling Raviji, the conventional meat producers, which includes the mega food companies globally, but also people like Licious, Zap Fresh, fresh to, uh, fresh to Home, Meetigo, um, you'll see quotes from them in the press about this, are interested in this space because they see themselves as, you know, pro protein companies. Their, their meat doesn't necessarily have to come from a chicken, right? As long as they are growing and they're giving consumers what they want. Um, but they, they'll want to adhere to like really high standards of taste and quality, et cetera. And that's what we're there to work with those companies and, and help them bring products to market as well. So that, that's our hope is it'll happen. And that'll be amazing, right? For, for conventional meat companies that are seen as the, the authorities in meat. Because you look at a licious ad and it tells you everything. It says, look, I'm making this completely convenient. You don't have to go and haggle over the, the price and think, okay, it, how much of this is bone and how much of this is actual meat. And you don't have to go through that disgusting process of going to the chop shop and seeing it happen. We're gonna make this really convenient for you. That's why they're winning. Uh, for them to now launch a category, a, a product in a new category like plant-based meat um, will be really validating to the entire concept. And that, that's what we're hoping will happen. So without giving too much away, we think that those kinds of companies will launch stuff in this space as well. Well, another part of our university uh, is uh, we have centers of excellence in various areas. 
we have a global center for environment and energy, which is um, does some very cutting edge research in climate change and other other areas of environment and energy. And it's led by professors who are closely involved and working on some committees of IPCC and so on. So, so it's a very recognized center. And we have a researcher in that center, uh, Ayush Panara. Uh, Ayush, you have a question for Varun, right? Are you, are you able to come on camera and ask that? Uh, yeah. Uh, so the question that I wanted to ask to you is uh, the way existing plant-based nutrition is being commercialized by the big food companies. Do you think that there is a scope for individual researchers like us to develop and deploy solutions that focus on sustainable protein alternatives? I'm asking because I'm currently working on a carbon negative plant nutrition that comes at a cost of one US dollars. But I'm an individual and the current trend is quite big. So just wanted to know, is there any chance for individual researchers like us to develop and deploy solutions? So I'll, I'll address this in two parts. The first is just the general system, how it works. And then the second is talking about like the science of it and what the potential is on that side. But the, the first part, I think, you know, there are some forces that are a little bit over our heads in terms of technology transfer and commercialization and the support that you could receive as an individual researcher to bring something to market, wrap a company around your innovation and just take it to scale, right? I think yeah. those things become difficult. And, you know, India has a very, very... Um, fast growing entrepreneurial ecosystem, right? Like there are a lot of pieces aligning very quickly now with capital, both international as well as uh, domestic crowding towards um, venture, uh, venture startups, et cetera, all of that stuff, right? There's a lot that's happening in that space. And obviously this is not new. It's been happening for decades, especially the last decade. And we're seeing a lot of um, exits and, you know, Flipkart was bought for this, these many billion dollars, $16 billion. We're seeing a lot of stuff happening that's validating. And so more and more money will crowd into that. So that's good news. That's all good news. The bad news on that side is that we don't have a great track record currently on, on, on spinning out technologies from universities, right? And maybe that's a conversation we should all have, Raviji and, and everyone on this call at some point about how to create a thriving technology transfer ecosystem out of Indian academia. Um, the second part is um, you know, the research you're doing is very promising. And I, I can give you countless examples from our sector, which is, of course, plant-based meat, eggs and dairy specifically, and the ingredients and technologies that underpin them. Um, because you're working on plant-based, I'll focus on that. There's a company called Eat Just Inc. in San Francisco, which makes a plant-based egg, which fluffs and scrambles exactly like a regular egg, right? And they add uh, ingredients to it, and, they, and they've worked on a lot of stuff. The, the principal ingredient in it is mung bean protein. Now the mung bean has been grown in India for 4,000 plus years, all right? And what they found, what, what Eat Just Inc. said is they were looking at this incredible toolkit of plants, which has not been sufficiently leveraged. There's 392,000 species of plants that we know and each of them have so many different varietals and all of that stuff. And they found that mung beans have a great mix of amino acids and other components that give you that functionality. All of the stuff I was saying earlier, gelling, foaming, stability, emulsion, et cetera, protein dispersibility index, all of these things that you know better than I, Ayush. Um, and so they created this product out of mung beans, right? So what you can do as a researcher is unlock the incredible value of this toolkit. And I think your, your question in the chat actually said Ayurvedic as well. Yeah, absolutely. Look at Ayurvedic ingredients, re-examine them, you know, using the techniques and tools that we have available now at this time in history, you can create characterization projects and understand them to a much deeper degree and utilize them in innovative food applications, whether it's in our sector or elsewhere. I think that's what we should be focusing on and aiming all of this knowledge and this technology towards solving the world's biggest problems. That's why we are here and hopefully, I take it that's why you're here as well, Ayush. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, Varun, we also, thanks Ayush. Varun, we also have a, um, uh, uh, an, an area of research, both in teaching and research, uh, uh, called biological and life sciences (BLS) for short. And uh, Professor Balaji Prakash, who we talked to earlier, is uh, is in in that uh, um, area, as well as uh, an, uh, Professor Vivek Tanavde, who is also a professor in life sciences, and he's done a lot of work in stem cells and related areas. Uh, um, uh, if Vivek, you are there, if you can come on and maybe uh, Vivek and Varun, if you can uh, talk a bit in addition to Vivek, any questions you have, talk a bit about what, what uh, 
career paths do students from BLS have? And whether this new um, protein, alternative protein uh, sector has uh, career opportunities for BLS students? Sure, thanks, Ravi. Yeah. Yeah. So, Varun, I'd like to start off with a question, okay, and then we'll talk about the career paths. So, uh, you made a statement which said that um, meat eating is aspirational, and the, uh, there's a very positive correlation between the income of a country and its demand for meat. But if I look at certain countries like the US, uh, you know, chicken is actually a cheaper source of protein than uh, many of the plant-based proteins, right? So because you can get a uh, McDonald's chicken burger, one of the cheapest things that you can buy for less than a dollar. So the question is, uh, can we impose a carbon tax uh, on food uh, like we do in the transportation industry? So the airlines, the people who fly don't have a problem paying a carbon tax. Uh, compared to a uh, less uh, demanding uh, solution. And, and, and do you think this would be uh, acceptable to people or, or would it even help in, uh, then we are basically pricing the cost, the real cost of uh, growing that food into its price. Yeah, you know, you know carbon taxes are a great intervention in general, um, I would argue, uh, and much, much more equity myself than me have argued that carbon taxes should be part of an essential toolkit for a sustainability bouquet of interventions. Um, it will happen for meat, eggs, and dairy also. And I think it will happen first in the EU. Um, this is not something that we advocate for because the, these are, um, you know, we work, we work on this side of things, which is make alternatives available and attractive uh, and uh, viable. And then there's this other side of it, which is, um, you know, make it clear and price in the issues of animal agriculture, right? So these are two right. sides of, of, of a strategy. We work on this side, we do not work on this side. Um, and the thing is like, we have our fifth anniversary on Monday as, as an organization, right? And especially when we started, no one was doing this, no one, right? So all the, all the stuff you see now, hundreds of companies, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars invested in the space every year, et cetera, is momentum that to a great degree, the early actors in the space have built, right? So we're, we're continuing to run and, and move forward in this direction. But I do agree that uh, it's a good intervention that makes sense. Uh, it's just not an area that I'm an expert in and we don't really focus on that because it's quite, you know, it gets fraught as well because people, you know, special interests start arguing with each other, et cetera. So I think it will happen. It'll probably happen first in countries in the EU if I had to place a bet, maybe the Netherlands. And maybe we can talk about this if and when it happens and see if I was right. But um, yeah, I think th that's about it, yeah. Yeah, and so this actually is a good point to get on to the second point that Ravi made in terms of opening up new industries because uh, definitely, you know, in life sciences, we train our students uh, for a lot of skills that such industries would require. So for example, protein characterization, uh, looking at the nutritional value, even growing meat, so cell culture, mammalian cell culture, the basic of it is you know, uh, growing cells in the laboratory, which uh, our students are, are trained. And, and definitely this then opens up uh, new industries uh, and new job prospects, which were not there earlier. And this is always, uh, you know, I think a good thing. So I do see uh, biology in general playing a more uh, significant role or a more prominent role in the uh, food production going forward than it has in the past. Yeah, and just adding on to that, look, we need, we need engineers, scientists, marketing people, accountants, sales folks, business development folks, you know, within science and engineering, we need so many different disciplines, mm -hmm. mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, you know, for scale up, for manufacturing, we need uh, the biological sciences, we need biochemistry, we need food scientists, we need all of this in this industry because it's only gonna explode from here. So as I say, you know, abroad, things come, the ecosystem compounds on itself and it just grows very rapidly. In India, we're at the very beginning. We have a couple of dozen companies that we would say are credible, serious coming to market in this space, all right? I would say across all categories, including eggs and dairy, let's say about 30 companies. The great news is most of those companies, 60, 70% of them were formed or became very serious within the last 18 months, right? And these are people like Ritesh and Janelia Deshmukh's Imagine Meats, which we help them put together partnerships for product development and et cetera. So like with a lot of these companies, we've done everything short of actually filing the incorporation papers 
and making their products for them. We've provided advisory across the spectrum and helped them come to, come to the point where they are now. And our goal is to, the ecosystem should grow so big that even we can't keep track of it anymore. It should be a thousand companies in this space and it should create a million jobs. That's the hope, right? So I think we're going to need all the people we can get. Um, and uh, I think, you know, your work and, and people at Ahmedabad University, if you'd love, to, if you'd like to join our network, um, you know, maybe we should talk about university courses. We have specialized courses for this space that could leverage all of the other pieces that you already have in place. I think there's, there's so much to do and it's so exciting. We just have to get started. Thank you. Um, so may, maybe Balaji, Vivek and Varun, uh, all of you should uh, connect. I think there is a lot of opportunities both for joint research programs as well as uh, um, talent pool and students and so on. I think we are running out of time. Um, Varun, you need to um, uh, run away in a couple of minutes. Maybe one or two last ones if you can and two or three minutes is okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't mind, I'd love to address the question about economic prospects for the yes. space, yeah. jobs, etc. Because yeah. that's come yeah. from Aneri right at the end there. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I, so I agree actually, you know, the, the animal industry currently employs a lot of people. Um, the thing is, a lot of those jobs are not, especially if you're in a slaughterhouse, it's not the best job in the world. You're the most susceptible to these zoonotic diseases, for example, right? Like, so swine flu out, you know, even last year during COVID-19, there were multiple swine flu outbreaks, which affect, there were 86, 86 people affected in Meerut in, in Uttar Pradesh from swine flu in, in around May, I think. So th these things keep happening if you're a slaughterhouse worker, but generally um, it employs a lot of people. And especially on the smallholder farming side, these are animals are important assets that can get smallholders a lot of value, right? So uh, our goal is to not effect a disruption on those people. Our goal is simply to um, offer a diversification that addresses the, the big industrial scale part of this, right? And I think smallholder farming will continue, subsistence farming will continue with animals. We're not here to take away people's assets from them. So that's the goal. On the job creation side, as I said just now, uh, our goal should be to have scaled companies in this space, um, you know, companies like Impossible Foods and Beyond Overseas, which are doubling the size of their workforce, doing a lot of really great work uh, and create a lot of economic growth such that it actually creates an entirely new industry from scratch in this country. And that's what we need. We're seeing it happen in other places like space tech, et cetera. That should be our goal here as well. Okay. Um, any other question that pops up to you, Varun, or to um, Sudhir, who you want to close with? Because I think we, Varun will need to leave in a minute or two. Any burning question that you want to close with, Varun? So nothing is particularly popping out to me. If you don't mind, I might close out just by saying thank you so much. Uh, just hold on. I need to switch on my video again. I just, wanted, I just wanted to say once again, thank you so much, Raviji, uh, all of you who have arranged this. Uh, it's been really, really wonderful having this conversation. Sudhir, thank you so much for everything and for your patience and everything. Thank you so much. for uh, yeah. It's been thank a really you. great, really great engaging with you. And I hope we can take this forward. Uh, we have a thriving community of, you know, about 600 people now, which three years ago, I would have said is a crazy talk to get to this point. You know, 600 people who are students, scientists, entrepreneurs, um, even people from policy, uh, a lot of different areas who are looking at this problem and who are looking to come together and create this thriving new industry. And the great thing is people come in for different reasons. I would say inside our organization as well, um, you know, people come in, some, some people care about animals, some people care about sustainability, some people care about public health. As, as you mentioned, Sudhir, at the beginning, my full background was in healthcare. It was in public health. I was not in the, in the animal welfare space or any of that stuff, um, or even in climate change. So, you know, there's myriad reasons to care about this particular area and, um, you know, a lot of reward that can come from it. It's an incredibly innovative and, and sexy area right now. So uh, we hope that we can do more together and take this forward. Great. Uh, so uh, we'll pass it on back to Sudhir to close out. But before that, as I keep saying in all these conversation series that these webinars are just conversation starters. They are not the end of the conversation. So in this one, particularly Varun, uh, I'll connect you to uh, our uh, biological and life sciences uh, team, uh, Balaji, Vivek and others. And I'm sure uh, you all can do something together. I'm not 
technically savvy enough to say what you can do together but i am sure there will be things to do you, so will you, you will you at least cook and eat with us whatever it is that we do together ha huh. yeah that's my contribution would be that yes <laughs> Okay, so then we can close yeah. out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much to our colleague and student and other people those who have joined. We could not answer most of the questions, but uh, most of them were answered during the conversation. And others people can keep uh, uh, get in touch with you. Otherwise, I think this topic needs another round of discussion. Uh, so we would love to invite you again uh, in June or July so that uh, we want to have a second part of this conversation. So thank you so much everyone for joining us and see you on next saturday and thank you so much varun take care take care everyone and just you know you can contact me at india@gfi.org uh, you know our wonderful team members will take things forward with you and yes of course we look forward to taking this ahead yeah. thank, thank you, you everyone so take thank care you. thank you bye bye bye